Hello and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players. I'm your host, David Holloway, and I'm thrilled as always to be here with you. And um, I'm running solo again without my mate and colleague in arms, Paul. Hope you're doing well, Paul. Look, I am not going to talk too much in, in introducing Mr. James Prime or Jim Prime. Um, all I'll say to you is whether you know Deacon Blue or not, or the other amazing artists um, Jim has played with that you'll see listed there in the show notes, I don't care if you've not heard of any of them, please take the time to listen to this because without any shred of doubt, this is one of the most insightful and funny interviews we've done across 105 plus episodes. Um, it was just an absolute joy speaking with Jim. He's an absolute gem of a human being. Um, and I just loved, as you'll see, every minute of it. So be prepared to see lots of footage of me laughing, but do do check it out. Um, you'll see on the listing there is explicit language. Jim's not the first person to swear on the podcast and definitely won't be the last. Be aware there is a little bit of explicit language, but by God, if anyone ever deserves to swear, it's Jim and this is gold. So I'll talk to you after the show. Jim, I cannot thank you enough, um, and I feel a little bit guilty. Here in Australia today, we had the hottest Australia Day in 60 years. I can't imagine that's a problem for you at the moment in Scotland. No, we've had the hottest. Uh, we haven't. We haven't, actually. But it's actually we've had three storms in a row, and uh, there's there's things in my back garden, I don't even know what they are, that come off roofs and... But you know what? It's it's fine. It's fine. It's not cold. It was really cold for a while, and then it's just windy and wet. But that's Scotland in a nutshell: windy and wet. My dad used to say it was like living underneath a dirty, sodden duvet. Uh, that's basically the best way to describe <laughs> Scotland. You know, I love it. <laughs> Yeah, look, I must admit, I've had the privilege of going to Scotland um, twice, but uh, particularly one trip where I went right up to the Orkney Islands and it was summer and it was still freezing. So yeah. I, I get what you're saying. Um, yeah, look, cannot thank you enough again. Um, you're the second person ever, Jim, where we've had the privilege of meeting you face to face before we do the full in-depth interview. So, I mean, uh, we're going to talk about your whole career of which Deacon Blue is only one part of it, but I thought we'd just kick off with you, you completed a, a highly successful um, tour down this way um, at the end of last year. Um, yeah, what, what was your perspective on that? I, sorry, and I'll just add a bit more there. I bought tickets before I approached you to come on the show because I've been a Deacon Blue fan <laughs> since the 80s. And um, so, yeah, I missed out on freebies. Very disappointed. Um, but... I I was very excited to see you guys, and I, I have to say for our listeners and viewers that haven't seen Deacon Blue live, you absolutely need to because I'm a cynical old bastard. Uh, I'm assuming a bit like you, Jim, and um, I, what I saw was a night of pure joy. What I saw was a tight band that did an amazing job that is still at the top of their game releasing new music um, as well as playing some of those amazing Songs. It was just an absolute privilege to watch you guys in action. Thank you for <laughs> <Got nothing. laughs> No, I'm really bad at this. You know, I just kind of like a tortoise. You know, it's like, um, look, it, it, it's quite simple, really, and it's a it's a big kind of compliment. So thank you very much. And and it's, uh, do you know what it is? It's it, we, it's we just don't have to try so hard anymore because we're we're kind of you know in our sixties. Well, two of us are. And it's just, it's got to be fun, but it's got to be good, you know, and it has to be, um, it has to be really good fun, but it has to be extremely kind of tight and polished. But that's, that's just the way we are. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that you don't hear that is kind of possibly a bit kind of like rough, but we're, I think the word is consistent and, that, and that's, that's, we can relax a bit because we know what the benchmark is and, I'll tell you what, let's stop talking about me for a second. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Uh, the Keyboard Chronicles is fantastic. It's an amazing privilege to be asked to come and do this show because I spotted some of my heroes on your website and I thought, I've got to do this. You know, it's, it's like an epitaph. 
uh, in some ways. Uh, but it's actually a real privilege. So thank you very much. To, and, and a hello to everybody in Australia. And thank you, everybody, for making the Australian and New Zealand trip the most amazing time I think I've had in so many years. Every place we went to, it was just amazing. And Perth and just just great people, great food, great atmosphere, great attitude, everything. And uh, so I'll thank you with that. So that's the answer to your question. No, that's amazing. Thank you. And uh, so we'll definitely come back to Deacon Blue for sure, but I thought we'd start off with your musical upbringing. So sort of that 20 years ago when you were a young fella in your teens, Jim, what what was what got you into music and, and made you realise you had a passion for it? I'll, I'll make this quite short because I was brought up um, classically trained and I didn't really know anything about anything. And my dad said to me, he was Canadian, um, so I was part Canadian, so I came. I come from a, a long line of, of, of piano players in my house, up with three sisters, and so they all played the flute and the guitar and the piano and stuff like that. But I had something else that was going on, and my mum said, uh, I didn't know this, but my mum told me that um, I started playing piano when I was four. Uh, so it was before even preschool, you know, or kindergarten. And uh, she said, I was in the kitchen and you heard Loch Lomond on the radio and you ran through the piano and you just played the melody. And that, you couldn't even play the piano, you couldn't even reach it. And um, I guess that's something that uh, I've sort of, I know inside myself that, you know, that I, I just, I, I'm kind of joined to this thing. Uh, so, but in reality, to get into the music business um, was just I kind of fell from one thing to, to the other, you know. And uh, I, I guess I met this guy called Alan Thompson, and he plays for or played for John Martin uh, for years. And he was my next door neighbour. And he used to arrive at the house at eight o'clock in the morning and kind of drag me out of my bed and I was and, and practice things like Bill Bruford and that's like and Gong. I'm going, oh, you really need to learn this, you know. Right. No. Like, I don't understand any of this. Right? And it was just a whirlwind of, of have you heard Sidney Dan, have you heard this, have you heard that, have you heard that, listen to this, listen to that. And he was, you know, he, he is still manic. You know, he plays for a guy called John Jorgensen, and um, he's on tour all the time. And, uh, but he really drove me. And then we were practicing with a band called the Arthur Trout Band, and uh, we were in an instrumental kind of bit like gong. But I was definitely the outsider, you know, and, and I guess I've always felt that a bit of an outsider, watching the world uh, in some way with a kind of mild uh, kind of mystery about it all. <laughs> What's going on here? And in walked this guy called John Martin, and he was a, a popular musician over here, and I think he's kind of well-known over there as well. And he was the cousin of our sax player, and he was mysterious, and I loved his music, and I was like, oh, he's a professional. And I was still going to Leonard Skinner concerts, you know, on the QT, you know, and I, I am going to say it loud and proud. Leonard Skinner were the reason that I became a keyboards player. I, I, I saw a guy go. in a white suit playing a white piano with three guitar players that were killer down south duking and, and really none of your free bird stuff. It was this was what are you doing on stage with these guys? And he was, uh, Billy Powell was just like outrageously good and the band were so tight uh, and that was it. My jaw was on the ground and the answer to your question is that that's, you know, everything came into contact. I have no idea how I actually ended up in it. I just fell from one thing to the other. Which is, yeah, it's amazing. And we, we're going to talk about a number of those artists that you just mentioned, but I, I wanted to uh, sort of trawl back to 1980 because I, I do believe one of the earlier acts you played a role uh, with was Altered Images, which, yeah. again, people around the world may be aware of. T um, how did you come into that? And I know that was after they'd, I believe, released at least a, an album. So, but just tell us about that phase. So there was a studio in Glasgow called... Um 
Park Lane, and there was only two studios in Glasgow, Park Lane and Savar, and um, it had just opened, and I, I basically had just walked in with my friend Alan Thompson and said, can we record? And they went, oh, well, okay, because uh, they were practicing, really. And then in the interim, uh, Kenny MacDonald, who was one of the uh, kind of drawers at the time, is sadly uh, departed now, but in fact, he lived out in New Zealand. But uh, cut a long story short, uh, someone said, uh, do you fancy a... a um, play with this band called uh, Altered Images and I said yeah, whatever you know and it was like they were ultra modern uh, pseudo pop kind of uh, punk kind of off the back of Susie and the Banshees um, they loved talking heads they loved modern fashion she looked at Audrey Hepburn and I looked like none of these things Right, so, <laughs> but fuck it. Right, so in I went, and I was expecting a hard gig, but instead all I got was, right, so that sounded quite good, £100 a week, and uh, I ended up touring the States with them, and, and now I was about, you know, like, really young. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And so did you have to, as far as gear, not that we talk a lot about keyboard gear, Jim, but... Um, at that stage, did you had much to do with synths and sequences and stuff like that, or was that your first sort of exposure? I had a Fender Rhodes, and my mum bought it, and it cost five hundred pounds, and it was probably half a year's salary to most people at that time. And it was a great thing. Absolutely, scene. people used to come around to my house and they'd say, "He's got Fender Rhodes," you know. It's like the earth, the gym's got Fender Rhodes, you know? and that was it. And I had a Yamaha CS something 10 or something, which was awful. Buttons on it, but that, that was all I had. And I borrowed stuff. The chorus pedal, CE2. And I had borrowed John Martin's CE1, which was unbelievable. And so, I had this big metal thing. It just made things stereo. And, but no, I, and I ended up playing through a, a Yamaha amp, a G100. And in fact, one at one stage I had a Yamaha bass spin bass um, B one five, I think it was called, and it had a distortion thing, and it was made. And then I got the sound on it, and people go, "What's that sound?" You know, like, well, it's I don't know, but it's uh, right. So I had no gear, and so Altered Images uh, presented me with um, two. OBXAs and uh, Oberheim OBXAs. Wow. And that was interesting um, to tour with, you know, because I needed to go and buy a tape recorder because you had to load the sounds via a little tape machine, which uh, I think I got in Radio Shack or Tandy, I think it was called it. And whether it loaded or not was a lottery. You know, it was like you'd hear this thing like a fax machine. And it would just go, it was never the same. So I, t- I, I toured with this, and that was actually going to be one of my train crash stories. But the real thing was the Oberheim was an amazing synthesizer. You get four notes polyphonic with it, but it was um, a beast. It really was. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I can imagine that. Oh, PG, okay. And you know that no one in the band, including me, knew how to work it. Because the instruction manual was in German. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And I only know Donner and Blitzen, Achtung and Ja, and that's it. And I couldn't find <laughs> any of these words in the manual. So I just kind of went with the pictures, and uh, but it was very complicated, and we got one sound out of it, so we used it all the time. Uh, but the Oberheim and the PPG <laughs> was fine. Uh, my introduction to synth. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. I'm, I sympathise with you on the PPG. Um, and so uh, w- when that wrapped up, Jim, what was the sort of bridge between that and then uh, you and I know the, the people in Deacon Blue forming that together, but what was the bridge between that and, and that occurring? Well, off the back of Altered Images, so I got asked to do this thing. Um, it all kind of happened at the same time at Cumberland Theatre, which was a which probably was the most important experience for me. 
because working in theatre gave me a chance to work with techies and lighting guys, and it was just a little theatre. But it was a community theatre, and all the people who were there were basically unemployed. But I got a salary, and I, I kind of made my money up doing a couple of pantomimes, uh, and I loved that. It was like old-fashioned piano player playing with film, you know, and I think that the theatre experience really taught me how a show should be put together and what the audience expects to see rather than just hear. Uh, so I, I worked there for a couple of times and then uh, John Martin wanted me to join his band and he was uh, an alcoholic um, and a violent alcoholic and an uh, unpredictable alcoholic. Uh, fantastic music, but a real, really difficult to work with. And he would come on stage and kind of throw a pint of lager at you and, and say, you know, why are you not touring? And I was scared of him, and, and I feared it. So I stopped music industry because I thought it was all about getting absolutely wasted, as I did. You know, I just went along with it and drank too much and took drugs. And I don't mind saying that. That was, you know, that was then. And, uh, and I got the fear. So I left the music industry, and I ended up in a computer centre. I worked in a bar for a wow. while, and then I worked in a computer centre for the Clydesdale Bank. And that job uh, really helped me affirm that I never wanted to be in the real world. I needed to be in a band. And thus, um, this local DJ said, have you heard this guy, Ricky Ross? And, and so... Uh, in between doing a lot of kind of little gigs and things like that, I met up with Ricky and we just hit it off. And you see, the thing is, post-punk around about 1984 or 5, nobody was playing piano or everybody was just going to go and sing. And if you played a chord that wasn't, you know, like a, a, a straightforward chord, then people went, you're a jazzer. And I'm like, I don't know what that means, yeah. but you know, I was I was kind of learning Steely Dan chords, and I could never use them. And then I met Ricky. He went, "Oh, like that one," and they went, "Oh, that sounds like you know, uh, Kings of the Western World or something like that, you know." And and we, we, we kind of obviously the name uh, Deacon Blue uh, comes from. Still done. Yeah, there we are. No. Again, for those that are uh, listening and watching, and I don't think there'd be many, but if you're unaware of Deacon Blue, um, do check out the whole discography, and it's 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 huge and it's still ongoing. Um, those first two albums, I mean, what you're saying, Jim, there could be more spot on. Is and this stood out to me as a teenager in the 1980s. It was that beautiful piano work with the strings, and just it was different. It was something that sounded different to anything that had come before. Um, and obviously you've built on on that since. Um, so what what did you learn as a player in those those early periods of doing the hard yards, touring around small venues and, and getting a name? What did you learn as a player? That being a piano player is a pain in the ass uh, because everything weighs so much <laughs> and you need a big car. And I learned that I think the biggest learning curve for me was, you know, uh, was dealing with fear. And, and that goes out to a lot of people who don't like talking about that sort of thing, but fear of not being good enough, fear of um, just being a bit of an imposter. And I think a lot of musicians, fellow musicians yeah. will agree. You kind of do these early gigs, and you do them because someone says you've got to do it, you know. And But we, we slept in the back of vans and, and under duvets, and, and we played five people, three of which were the cleaners, you know, and they wanted to know when we could switch the lights out. Um, and we played some pretty horrible places, but there was just something about being in a band and that camaraderie that, that, that kind of develops. You know, you, you see warts and all when you're in a band. and that, I guess that's what I learned most was to trust other people that, the world is full of good people rather than bad people, which I had experience of. And I thought the music industry was so scary in the 1980s. You know, there was far too much cocaine and far too much 
bigging up videos and bigging up yourself and fashion and, and lights and telly. And, um, it was all a bit overwhelming, but the playing never changed. So you're right in saying that it was, it was new at the time, but it really wasn't. It was, it was from Elton John's days. It was what I was brought up with was Elton John and Stevie Wonder. You know, that's what I, before I found out what Steely Dan was, Elton John was my main inspiration because when I saw him when I was young on the telly and he was playing this gospel Americana and he was from Luton or Wat- Watford, wasn't it? Uh, I'm going, how can you do that? How can a guy from Watford and another guy from Norfolk or something like that write about, you know, Greyhound buses and, me and my gal, and I thought, I, I, I can do that, you know. So I learned. And the other thing was, I was brought up in church, and so these chords that you learn at, at, in the church are amazing, you know. They, they are these, you know, that kind of, and I, you know, I, I kind of like that idea that we, you could, uh, fine in gospel and then soul music. I fell in love with soul music and I went, oh, this is just church music made fun, you know. So, and I listened to Elton John, I went, he's the same. He, he's got that churchy chords. And I, I, I kind of graduated into the idea that actually I've been playing all my life in churches and schools and, and, and what an influence that was. So, what I learned during that time was how to work synthesizers. And um, that was like interesting because I failed physics three times and I was at the bottom of the class and the guy came in with a synthesizer and went, this is how waves work. And I got it immediately. You know, I was like, oh, and this is how ohms work and hertz and all that stuff. Uh, so I learned and, um, no uncertain terms. Uh, the 80s were a real big learning curve for me. Um, and once I, but you see, because I'd been in altered images, when I joined uh, Deacon Blue, we were rehearsing in the basement of our printers, you know, with dust everywhere. And, and But I had been the professional, you know, I'd been on tour, I'd been in the band, I'd recorded an album. So. I kind of knew it all, and I said, yeah, so Diggity was just a, a ballad. And I said, no, you need to make it poppy. And I know how to, because I've been in altered images. So um, we started looking for riffs and things like that. So it, it was a bit of a manic clash, but it, it, it was great fun. Great fun. Sorry. I ran. Absolutely. Absolutely. And- no, not at all. No, that that's fascinating. And just I want to hark back to you talking about the 80s being a challenge both technologically and then personally. You've mentioned the fear and imposter syndrome, and you're absolutely right. A number of our guests have talked about that. What? How did you – you may never uh, overcome it totally, but how did you mostly overcome that imposter syndrome? What, what was the turning point for you where you felt – I deserve to be doing this, and I'm doing relatively well. I would uh, like to say that I learned a lot, but I I drank my way through the that's what I'm, and I just drank. Yeah, and um, I didn't take drugs, uh, but I drank a lot and learned the hard way. Um, but uh, I'm sober now, and I'm happy to join that many band of people who uh, who are very happy to say that they're sober on a daily basis. And uh, I'm okay with that because it's uh, it's a dawning realization a little late that you cannot use the fact that you're a musician and you're artist blend of being funky and different for too long before, as they say, it was fun and then it's fun with a problem and then it's a problem, right? So it became a kind of a go-to thing to get you on stage, to party afterwards, to get you to get you, you know, rid of these nerves. And I guess I also struggled with the fact that I was married at the time and, and I had a kid on the way and, and trying to fit this life into marriage is really difficult. But so is being in the yeah. army and so is being in the navy and people manage it somehow. I think I probably, if I if I was to go back in time and say, right, don't, 
don't pick up that first drink. You know, I, I might have had a completely different experience. And now, as I teach in a university, I, I, I incorporate all this because I know the way that we think. And we're a bit obsessive and compulsive. And, and I have to tell kids, going, I'm having the best time of my life in the last 10, 15 years. And um, alcohol and drugs and any kind of thing like that's not part of it. And I'm so delighted to tell you that life is really, really good when you when you you, you realise that that actually it it's it, it, I think it's a confidence thing with a lot of people. You know, I, I think it was just that for me. There was no other reason. I just like didn't feel confident enough, not good enough, imposter syndrome. And and also it has a tendency just a bit to make you feel different than anyone else that's out there. So I'm Scottish. So, as you know, everybody needs to buy milk. You know, that's my modus operandi is, it doesn't matter whether it's 20,000 capacity stadium, the next day you're in a supermarket or you're taking your dog a walk, right? One of these things, that's real. The hydro isn't real. It's just a show. That's what you do. But your life is turned upside down in the 1980s, 100 shows a year. Uh, and I know uh, I'm not alone here with other musicians out there. And if anyone's out there that listens to this nonsense uh, of me talking, then uh, getting rid of all that shit is good. Really good. It is, no, and that's it's far from nonsense. I think that's an incredibly valuable um, perspective. And I mean, given the challenges you've just mentioned that you had and that you've overcome, you certainly had some great songwriting chops um, in Deacon Blue alone, let alone anything else. How did you develop as a songwriter? What what was the approach? And you've got. I mean, some of the most amazing songwriting credits just within Deacon Blue, you know, some of the biggest hits and so on. How did that develop for you as a as skill? Well, I uh, suffer from everything that every other musician has, uh, has, which is instant ability to write the first bit and then not do anything with it or join up the dots. Ricky is far more, he's, he's equivalent of a librarian, you know, he just goes, no, everything's in its order, we will stop and we will start for, we'll have a cup of tea and then we'll go back to it and we'll work and work and we'll finish it. I can never finish it, so that's why collaboration works for me. And so when you're, when you're writing something, um, you'll constantly say, this is something else, this is somebody else's song, oh, this is, sounds like, whereas, Ricky is much more of a kind of like, you know, there are so so many chords and there only has so many beats. And if something interesting happens, it happens because you're in the room with other people. And and that was the secret, because I think a lot of people just sit at home and go, oh, this is, this is my song. Actually, it doesn't come alive until somebody else gets a hold of it. So I can't take credit for all my songs and stuff like that, but I can, I can I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a riff merchant. I look for the riffs, you know, so I think, I still think in 80s terms where every song should have a riff, it needs to have a riff because when you're, when you're writing songs, you need to think about other people singing them, not you. And why do we go to concerts? So I think when you boil it down to it, people go to concerts to have an experience so that they can talk about it. So you need to create a moment. Um, they don't really react to the perfect song the way that we think they will. They they like warts and all. They want to feel, they want to dance. They want to sing. And they want to feel part of the whole thing. So um, what better way than write a, a song, you know. There are only so many things you can do with an audience, you know. Uh, with a microphone is their favourite moment, you know. That's what they go home and go, oh, we sang our heads up, loaded, you know. Um, but then, to get back to the original question, a lot of what I write, it comes from church. I mean, loaded is all yeah. church chords or... <laughs> that's gospel, you know. So 
I'm playing it because I love that shit. <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah, I love it. I'm sorry about swearing, but I, I don't know what to do with it. And Ricky does. Uh, so he'll he'll sing a riff. Yeah. And he walks around the room with that. Yeah. I like that way of writing. I've had success for... Well, I'm actually doing a lot of Scottish, Scottish stuff. So I'm trying to reinvent this. Uh, I, I'm getting married to this beautiful girl, uh, Beatrice, who's a singer, and she's looking for songs and stuff. And I said, well, look, I'm good at this. Uh, and like, I, I like the piano and I like about Hammond. Um, I don't see a lot of Hammond in, in trad. So it's very interesting. So we're, we're kind of, she does a lot of Scottish stuff, you know, all that uh, songs about cows going from field to field, and sheep getting sheared. And, and, and feeling away from home all the time, even though you are home, you know, and just so I, I, I'm, I'm now writing by listening and learning to other people who are really good at what they do. It's an interesting fact. I, I'm really gone back to basics recently, and I'm using a thing called Celtic Era too um, to try and and you know have a look at how Baran players play. Have a look at how, particularly the resonator or the dogro players play. So I'm studying. I'm studying guitar players at the moment, and I'm studying wow. fiddlers, and I'm and I'm listening to some of their stuff and the way they play, and then I translate it back onto the piano and come up with you know uh, dad gag chords like that. And that's how I learned with John Martin, and that, and that's why I I I try and spend at, at least. Um, a couple hours a day at the moment, going back, not just to the piano, but going to other instruments. And that's how I'm, I'm getting inspiration to write new songs now. Uh, and I always, that's amazing. Well, my, my guitar player, uh, Gregor, says, uh, I'm a keyboard player that thinks like a guitarist. And it's because John Martin <laughs> said, whatever you do, never say you're influenced by, I, I just have actually, but uh, never say you're influenced by um, the instrument you play or the voice so he would say his influence would be Billie Holiday Peggy Lee but they're female singers and they went then nobody guesses where, where you got it from <laughs> that's true we, that's all a- steal, we all steal like artists that's what I say that's a great good, tip yeah that's good, a great tip you know, there's a great Australian. No, that's it. There's a great. There's a great Australian woman, um, uh, Margaret Ulrich, from the 1980s. Oh yes, right. Yes, she has the most killer song that nobody I know knows, and I'm so delighted to say I'm going to rip it off. So uh, you can you can sue me, Margaret, <laughs> if you ever see this. Yeah, Margaret had a few hits, and um, yeah, great artist. So, yeah, perfect person to rip off. She she has such a great um, voice. She had just an amazing. She does. Voice. Amazing. Um, one thing I definitely wanted to cover in this short period of time we had together is, on top of all this and the huge success that you are having with Deacon Blue, and please excuse me if I get the timelines wrong, but you also yep. took up um, playing with uh, Johnny Halliday. Now, I I'll be the first to admit ignorance on Johnny Halliday, and I was gobsmacked to find out that he's con- um, one of the world's best-selling artists. Obviously, enormous in France. Um, yeah. Tell us about how that gig came about and your role in the, this amazing nineteen-night run um, at the Bercy. So, yeah, I'd just love to hear about your time with um, Johnny. Well, you asked me about that, and uh, most of my uh, evening entertainment is based around that time and, and it, it was uh, yet another alcoholic right um i had no money <laughs> the band had split up uh, we were just taking a rest in the 96 i was doing a play um in glasgow called big picnic uh, which in itself was amazing but i got offered this job now i met a guy this is why i was in the music industry i met a guy in the Legendary hotel um, in London, um, and he sang for a band called uh, Sad Cafe. Every day, every day, hearts have nights. Sad Cafe were uh, they had one, you know, uh, 
And he was an amazing singer from Manchester. But, and we had a great laugh and drank too much uh, one night at the Columbia Hotel in, in London, which is where all the artists stayed because it was cheap. Right? And um, he phoned me up and said, um, Hi, Jim, you don't remember me? Um, and I went, no, I have no recollection. He says, I've got this gig. Uh, how do you fancy doing it? You know Chris Kimsey, the producer. Well, he produced one of the Deacon Blue records. And he said, yes, well, he's producing this guy, Johnny Halliday, and he's put you up for the gig. And I said, well, is that a kind of, what kind of gig is what, what? He said, well, look, it's you or, or some American keyboard player I'm not even going to mention because he's so good. Uh, and he said, well, I'm like, go and stroke that ego. And I go, well, actually, what's the money like? And he told me, and I went, uh, I'll be there. Uh, I don't care whether it's, I don't care whether it's, you know, uh, electronic dance music, really. Uh, that money will do, thank you very much. Uh, and I love Johnny Halliday, even though I know nothing about him. Uh, and so I went out there, and it was the most bizarre band I've ever been in. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I'm Jim James from Prestwick in the west coast of Scotland. I'm actually from Glasgow. Uh, and here we've got uh, Rod Stewart's guitar player, uh, Dire Straits guitar player. We've got Bee Gees keyboards player. We've got King Crimson's drummer. We've got a bass player from Ozzy Osbourne, and they are <laughs> unbearable people. And Johnny, who comes in in skin tight, he looks like, you don't know the Bruins, but it's a, it's a character called Desperate Dan. Right? He's got really, really skin tight trousers and a belly like this, and a cowboy hat on. And everybody's walking about in leathers and cowboy hats and cowboy boots, and, you know, bass player's got skull things around his. Well, and they were Buddhists, and I only eat, you know, sriracha, you know, for breakfast, and, you know, well, really. And <laughs> I eat chips, and I eat, you know. So I, I kind of just did what I do really well, which is bring people down to my level. And uh, it, it turned out really good. And, you know, I am, Ricky describes me, that's why the song what The Wildness is called The Wildness. It's about me. I am wildness in a bottle, right? So I get out there and I'm calling everybody a cunt, you know, sorry, a bastard. And they're all going, ooh, that's not very Los Angeles, you know, it's not very expat, is it? You know, darling, you know. And by the end of it, they're all drinking the fish and smoking and things. <laughs> I'm not having it. I just don't. You know, my dad said, bullshit baffles brains. Three Bs in life. I don't yes. believe that you're any worse, better or worse than anybody else. And so we embarked on this tour to begin with in an album with Johnny. And um, the rest is the train crash that you asked me to talk about. Do you want me to talk about the train crash? Yeah, you, you're welcome to talk about the train crash. That's I fine. You asked me. Uh, to describe a train crash of my life, uh, and it actually was in a train, uh, because the set for Johnny Halliday was this industrial kind of units and towers with flames coming over, and there's all these funny things going on, the rehearsals, you know, there's these grits in there. I'd never worked with pyros before, and, and it was just like ridiculous. Johnny, skin-tight leather jeans and puffy white shirts and lint, you know, and, and Satin this and satin that. And this is just French rock and roll is an oxymoron. It's like France, rock and roll, Atlantic. Right? That's all I'm saying. And they were singing, they got you know, and, and then the fucking flames came out, set fire to his shoes, right, while he was playing. And that was hilarious. Of course, I get... Uh, so during one of the shows, um, there was a kind of breakdown bit where they did rock and roll. Right? So they did shake, baby shake, and there was double bass, and there was a snare drum. They were all there at the front. And there was a kind of lip 
and it went round and all the diehard Johnny Halliday fans, this is at Percy. And uh, so the tennis stadium is huge. And there's like 20 nights there, or 19 nights. And then Johnny, who's in his 50s, yeah, right, in his late 60s, um, does the splits like that. Because he was trying to be rock and roll, like, you know, Elvis Presley. <laughs> Except his hips popped out. All right, so <laughs> he's lying on the stage like this, looking up at me and going, I can't get up. I'm fucked. <laughs> and everybody's going, hey, baby shake. Shake, basil. So basil's going, dum, 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 dum. and these, these security guards came on and pulled them all the way around the lip for these legs like that, right the way around and off the back of the stage. And there was a couple of drum solos, another bass solo, a piano solo, another bass solo, and then let's do the hand clap. Okay, and everybody, shake, baby, shake. Now the French can only do shake, baby, shake. They had to do it on the beat, but we were going shake, baby, shake. They were just going. <laughs> Meanwhile, side of the stage, Johnny Halliday is getting his legs popped back in. Right, so. They've got, wow. they've got a guy pulling his arms and a guy pulling his legs, and there's a doctor there giving him a cortisone shot saying he's practicing. And <laughs> they pop him back in. He drinks about, I think, about half a bottle of Jack Daniels in a one hour. Comes back out, and I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm going to have to finish the show with him. I, I sit at a piano with this 50 foot French flag. And Johnny Halliday's eyes are in the back of his head and he's, he's just about to pass out. And in front of everybody, 20,000 people, he goes, he leans on the piano and goes, I can't speak. But, and then the microphone goes, Jim, Jim, I love you, but I don't understand a fucking word you say. That's all I'll say. So. That's brilliant. It's, it was a reminder that I'm Scottish, and it was also a reminder <laughs> how up themselves some people are. And uh, Shane Fontaine, who was the guitar player, um, who's also known as Mick Barakan, he's with uh, Graham Nash now, I think, and he was out. And we formed a great friendship with, uh, with each other's band. Robin Le Missouri uh, sadly died last year. He was with Rod Stewart and Ronnie, uh, and, and the drummer, uh, Ian Wallace, um, he sadly passed away as well. So there was only a few of us left, and Tim I don't speak to, but uh, he's, he's still doing BG stuff, and, and uh, um, Phil Susan out in America. So uh, they're actually really good friends, and yeah, they're, they're dead famous and all, but they're just people, you know, and that's That's, that's right. That, that that is an amazing, amazing story. I, I have to say that's easily one of the best train wreck stories ever. Oh, well, no, no, that's gold. There are worse, but I can't go there. Um, but uh, yeah, the, it, I find half of my life it's like watching it. It's watching my life and going, what, what is it actually going on? I'm standing here beside Michelle Obama, you know, and she's going to say, give me a hug. I'm going, I'm from Prestwick. I need to buy milk tomorrow. I can't accept right. any of this. This is not happening. You know, I'm not very good at what I do. I just happen to be really lucky. Uh, and yes, yes, that's, that's kind of, that's me. Totally. No, love it. I absolutely love it. Now, you did mention the Big big Picnic theatrical production. I did have that on my list to cover with you. So you mentioned before, way back when you're working on Panamise, you love the theatre, and, and we're alike in that. I just love the whole theatre scene. So tell us about yeah. The Big Picnic and what that meant to you as a, as a production. Huge. Um, you know, I openly uh, love musicals, and, 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 and I was hugely influenced by musicals in my youth, like The Sound of Music. And, and I still, I think I've seen Wicked three times, you know, and and I know the drummer who plays in it, and I, I just like, well, wow, this is fucking brilliant, you know. This is like, and it's like I got approached by this guy called Phil Cunningham, and he is a 
legend of accordion playing in Scotland, him and Ali Bain, fiddler. And he said, how do you fancy joining this outfit? And I said, yeah. yeah. And I said, who else is playing? And the great musicians playing. And he says, this is the story, right? So it's in a disused uh, shipyard inside, in, in, in one of the kind of dry dock areas. And it's just basically concrete floors, tin roof. And we're in a 15-piece band with cello and all the rest of it on a kind of makeshift gondola up there in the roof with pigeons shitting on you, water flooding through the roof, people in coach. <laughs> it's a great gig, he said, you know, and, you're, and the, the monitor guy, and the PA guy's up there as well. <laughs> it's everybody's up there. And what it is, is the most amazing theatre theater thing I've ever seen. And it's, it's called Promenade Productions, and it was the entire First World War set with uh, trenches and everything to scale. And the audience were on uh, basically a rake seating on a railway at the side, and there was scaffolding all around about it. And, and one end was, was the, the, the area of Glasgow called Govan. Uh, where the shipyards are, and this was all about governed guys going to war. And it was true in the sense that my great uncle went to war when he was 21 in the First World War and was killed. And 21, just think about that, 21 years old, right? So it was very emotive, and there was lots of great actors, Scottish actors, um, you know, and uh, it was tough, uh, but it was un. Believable when it actually happened. The, the full pipe band, and we were playing along with them, up and, and, and it really brought a lump to your throat as a score, as a you know, just the idea of these innocent people going to work. And the music was fantastic. Phil Cunningham wrote some beautiful stuff, and a guy called John Tams, who's a kind of trad guy, a folk guy, was involved, and a lot of people really paid homage to that. Um, and then a lot of players there I'm still friends with today. And I kind of had to stop because I had to go to France to, to, to be with Johnny Hartley. But I think that will remain as one of the yeah. most amazing things I've ever done. And I think you can Absolutely. see it on YouTube if and you're hunting for it. Big picnic. Okay, no, we definitely will, and we'll link to that. Yeah, that's great. No, I'll definitely find that. Um, and I have to ask, and I'm not sure what the link is at all, Jim, but uh, Little Richard, tell us about any involvement you had with Little Richard. Funny story coming up, number five. So we're in America and we're doing possibly the worst album we've ever recorded because we've got money now. And uh, Deacon Blue are there for about a month and we're just basically drinking vodka and sitting in jacuzzis. Right, and we're recording in Sunset Sound. Now, Sunset Sound is a really basic studio. You don't think of, you think of going into Air or Abbey Road or something like that, and it's all plush, and it's not like that at all. But the most amazing artists have ever recorded there, and, and including you know, Dion Warwick and all this, all your heroes. So we were recording there with a guy called uh, Dave Kahn, who'd done the Bangles, and uh, Dave Leonard, who'd been with uh, Paisley Park and, and, and Prince and stuff like that. And uh, they, were, they were okay. They, they kind of like me, but they kind of very American. And Dave said, hey, look, uh, Little Richard and MTV want in for a day, uh, and the payoff is, can you be in his band? because uh, they're going to film it for this thing called Folkways. And it's a legend who's coming in, and it's Little Richard. And I'm like, oh, funny. no problem. You know, uh, you'll be the piano player, and you're also to play, you know, um, the D50 organ sound. Uh, right? I'm like, okay, really? Uh, and the drummer is a... Fucking great drummer uh, called uh, Fish from Fishbone called Fish, and he's great. He really got the groove. And we were, I had been practicing on a stove 
because I didn't have a keyboard back in the flat, and so I'm just kind of learning how to look like I'm playing. Right, and kind of kind of doing that, so you can't actually see my hand. And I, was, I didn't do a shit for two days, right? I didn't actually eat anything or shit for two days, and I went to the session, and um, I did the piano bit, and then said, "No, you got to come in and do the." the the organ bit in the control room with Little Richard. And I said, well, what do I call him? Do I call him Little? Do I call him Dick? Rich? Richie boy? Do I, well, you know, I can't go, how you doing, Little Richard? That's just like, what's your name? No. Right, so, so I'm at the keyboards and I've got silver shades on. And, uh, you know, and I'm not really realising this is really important because the other people on the record are Emily Harris. Bruce Springsteen. And I'm going, I need to buy milk tomorrow. I need to buy milk tomorrow. <laughs> and he says, so the interviewer says to the little Richard who's sitting at the, the control desk, he said, um, so tell us about Woody Guthrie and, and, and Lonnie Donegan. And, and, and the song was Rock Island Line. Um, and he said, uh, oh man, he was a he made the big toe jump right out of your boot. Eh, Jim? And I went, yeah, aye, right enough. Aye, aye, Scottish answer. They're like, Pat, what did you say? Right enough? And I went, aye, well, you know, I mean, it's big toe. That's what he was like. Oh, mate, I kenned him. Aye, I kenned him. Aye, he was a good lad. Aye. He said, can we do it again and just shut up? Right, so... So I do that. So you'll see me going. And it's all... <laughs> <laughs> Bullshit does battle brains. So after the session was finished and it was like relief, all I could think about was going to go and do shit. I'm in the toilet, you know, laying a pipeline from here, <laughs> from here across the Atlantic. It was such a big shit. And little Richard's at the door going, You coming out for a photo, Jim? Mid shit. Little Richard said, Do you want a photograph? What do you choose? You decide. <laughs> <laughs> so I, in, in sorry terms, so I nipped it. <laughs> Literally. But this day, I don't know whether I flushed it or not. But if, <laughs> if there's anybody <laughs> that worked in the cleaning department of Sunset Science <laughs> that I had to call the plumbers, then I apologise. <laughs> but, <laughs> but there is a picture in existence of me and <laughs> Richard, like that. I'll I, am be, several I'll pounds. Be young. I am several pounds lighter be, than I was. There you go. Do you got that picture, Jim? I can honestly say that's the most I've laughed across 105 episodes. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is gold. <laughs> Uh, the truth is funny because it's real. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's that's probably a good juncture, Jim, to ask you one of our regular questions. Is, is, is there a keyboard player out there that you admire that you would love to hear more about their life story? And I know, I, I hope you don't mind me sharing that this with our viewers, but when I met you for the rig tour before we started recording, you, you were quite forthright, as our viewers will see today, and you basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, um, I would never have considered doing this, except I saw you had Bill Payne on your show, so I thought, why not? So, <laughs> um, what well, um, is there well, anyone? Yeah, well, is there anyone else that? Well, the thing is, um, I'd love to have met uh, Chuck Lavelle. Um, Chuck Lavelle. Yeah. Chuck Lavelle is is quite similar to the way I play. Um, I'd also like to meet and talk to uh, Dave Stewart. He was a huge influence yeah. on me, Dave Stewart, as in uh, Dave Stewart, Barbara Gaskin. Uh, he, that kind of English prog rock, kind of Eddie Jobson, and, and Dave Stewart was a major influence on all these, all these great cars. I <laughs> love it. I love it. I yeah. love his mm -hmm. sound. Yeah. So really, um, if you ask me, I'd love, still love to meet Elton John and, and, and Stevie Wonder, obviously. Yes. Um, but I'd love to chat with Chuck Lavelle or Dave Stewart. They're my uh, kind of great picks. Two players. Yeah, superb picks. 
And and the other dreaded question, Jim, is the Desert Island Disc. So if you had to pick five albums that totally shaped you, what what would they be? Well, uh, Steely Dan, uh, Asia, first, Gaucho second. Um, I love Gaucho and I love that Asia is is, is my album. Earth, Wind and Fire, uh, September, uh, the track I play every day uh, because it's the only song that, Utterly changes my mood, um, and I can I play it right. my school kids or my university students. I play it, and they all move. It's like Billy Jean. It's like one of those unbelievable tracks that is utter nonsense. You know, dancing in September. It means nothing, but you just give it that, and it just changes my mood. Uh, Leonard Skinner, still one of my favorite albums. Uh, uh, either pronounced or second helping, and again that southern country kind of influence on me. You know, long distance love. Um, my little George, little feet, Bill Payne. Sorry, I never mentioned, but Bill Payne, please. I met you in a lift. If you ever see this, I met you in a lift. I didn't know who you were. <laughs> he was like, oh, I'm a big fan of who's who's that miserable bastard that just got out of the lift. That's Bill Payne. <laughs> um, nice. So, Johnny Mitchell album Blue. It's it's just my go-to. Yeah. Um, in case of you, it's just unbelievable. And the when she does the jazz version of it with the orchestra, um, the guy who arranged it is the guy a guy called Gavin Wright, who who did who I worked with with Deacon Blue, and he did all the early stuff with the strings and stuff like that with me. Uh, so I've got to put a nod to these people. Uh, so Steely Dan, Earth, Wind and Fire. It's a track called Swamp Music um, by um, Leonard Skinner. And again, uh, it's just where you set a piano in amongst the most amazing rock band. Yeah. And I thought, yeah. Um, little feet for Bill Payne's outrageous you know, outrageous. I mean, I could say that I could go on and say the band and, and all the rest of it as well, but Bill Payne, just what planet is he on? You know, uh, yeah. do you know what I, I find similar between him and I? And that is, he is obviously working with a guitar player and he's working with a singer yeah. that is, is so linked into that country thing. Is, and it was something that John Martin said to me. He said, Learn the song, not your part. Learn the song because then if the singer decides to hold on a note for a little bit longer and add two bars, then you're with them. And that's what Will Payne, and particularly in long distance love, um, you'll hear that outrageous yeah. manner of style he's got. No, with that, and Joni, that's five brilliant picks. Thank you for that, Jim. No, that's superb. And I did, it was remiss of me. I did want to come back to you've mentioned the teaching and the School of Music and Recording Technology at yeah. the University of the West of Scotland. Um, so yeah. you're still involved with that. Now, I, I believe you're pivotal in setting that up. Am I right? Yeah, kind of. Well, what it was, was it was going to be a kind of big Scottish school of music, kind of school of excellence, and that was about 24 years ago. And then this, uh, the council tried to champion it, and uh, we got... Um, Dennis LaCourie from, from uh, Dr. Hook and Benny Gallagher, who is now still one of my best friends. He's a wonderful, lovely man. And they championed it. And they said, oh, you come on board, Jim. You're, you're famous. I'm like, mm-hmm. it's your town. You know? so, so I started my nose out, got involved in it, and it never happened. But the university, who has got a campus there, um, said, we'll take the course. If you can set it up. So me and Alan, the break, um, a wonderful, wonderful guy who used to play with a band called Big Dish. He mainly, and I just kind of tagged along, and then uh, they employed me to their horror. I'm still here. Um, because you can imagine a class with me is... is <laughs> it doesn't come from any book. Yeah. I, I, I'm proud That's to say great, that. though. I'm proud to say that I do what I teach, but I, you know, I've got to remember that you know a lot of young kids haven't joined the dots yet, and uh, I'll just try and keep them out of the holes that you can fall into, and also just 
brave about what they're doing, even if it's very, you know, early stages, what they do. And I try as much as I can now to tell people about the power that their music has uh, for other people, not just writing songs in bedrooms and being on the stage being a pop star, but actually helping Alzheimer's. And so I do a lot of work uh, with Alzheimer's Scotland and I've done stuff with um, special needs. And I try and encourage kids to get out there and, and talk to old people and, and help them with their memory, reminiscence. Interesting, before I go, I think I might have mentioned this before, but reminiscence bump is basically a theory which is, is, is pretty robust that says that most of our musical memories come between the ages of 11 and 25. And if you really want to learn, you know, how to reach your parents when they've got dementia, then just do some maths and work out when, where they are around about 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and then look for the music of that time, and you'll find that one or two of these songs will, you know, bring back memories and the links to where they were and who they were with and all that stuff. It's been done a million times. Out in Australia, there's a guy, uh, and I can't remember his name, but he's at Newcastle University uh, in Sydney, and he's doing marvellous work with that. And uh, all I would say, if you are a musician watching this, uh, use your music to help others. Uh, and don't be so selfish to think that it's all about me all the time. Which, when it boils down to it, I'm the first person to say that, you know, I'm only interested in myself, really. At the end of the day, I've got to keep myself alive. Uh, and if I'm worried about you, it's the effect you're having on me. <laughs> but what I do realise is when you do good for other people, don't look for a round of applause. You just see what effect it has. That's enough. That has more power than any round of applause. Okay. So my message... A absolutely. Message, yeah, look. Get out there. Yeah, if you're that's, sitting and the message, back and waiting for the next gig to come, get out and help somebody else. That's how you do it. Yeah. Uh, messages don't get much more important than that, Jim. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's in in incredible. Um, and then um, our very last question, which is our ten part quick fire ten, so just short and sharp answers to some some mini questions. Um, starting off with the first album you ever heard, if you can recall. Um, first album I ever heard uh, that I remember hearing was probably my dad's um, Stan Getz album. Um, but in reality, the first album I ever played that was my one when I was 11 was Hunky Dory, uh, David Bowie. And um, your most important pre-gig ritual, so let's use Deacon Blue as the example, what what do you need to do to feel like you're, you're settled for a gig? We do a group um, prayer, basically. Great. Excellent. The no, that's show. excellent. <laughs> no, okay, that thankful. makes sense. Um, it, <laughs> you have to be thankful for you know what you know what you're about to receive. We're very yeah. lucky, and we. No, that's we amazing. Be. Yeah, no, great. And if you hadn't been a musician, what do you think your career choice would have been? Probably a teacher, which is what I'm doing at the, at the same time. Probably mm. a teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um, transpose button or adjust on the fly? Oh, adjust on the fly. Never transpose that. Just dicks with my head. I actually had to play a yeah. gig. Now, there's a thing yeah. about the Oberheim. Oberheim AXA went out of tune when it got hot, and the, the, the tune dial only went so far, and then it was still out of tune. I had to play the whole song with the pitch bend, <laughs> pushing the pitch bend to make oh, it like hold up. Yeah, okay. the whole thing like that. Oh, oh well. <laughs> That's amazing. Yes, never um, no, I, that makes sense. Favorite gig you've ever done, if that's at all possible? No, that's not possible. I, I, I can't. Yeah, tell no you. problems. The one that's no, yet. that's okay. Yeah, actually, that's a great answer. And um, if again, may not be possible, but a favorite city you've played? Too many, too many. You know. Yeah. Um, I, it would be easy for me to say Glasgow because it's hometown and Edinburgh then and then we have a fantastic gig in Perth and I love Perth. Um, 
Well, I love Perth for the reasons that I know that I, I live by the sea here and I need the sea. Yeah. I need to see the sea and Perth's got it, you know, and it's got the weather and it's got the breeze. It does. And so I don't know. I think he makes up cities yeah. with uh, with people. It's all about people, you know. I mean, the Sydney game yeah. on the Australia That's too, true. Oh, yeah, this world, you know, and it was just brilliant. And so yeah, that's my favourite city at that time. Yeah. Sydney. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, I'll that, do the right thing. That makes sense. All of a sudden in Australia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, you've that's already sort of answered part. this one, Jim, and I. That's right. Uh, he, he, uh, you've sort of already answered this one, Jim, which is an artist you've never played with that you'd love to play with. So you've sort of mentioned a few great ones. Um, but anyone else that comes to mind? So if you had the choice tomorrow to play a gig with someone, who would it be? Elton John? Yeah, 100%. Stevie Wonder if he would, if, if he would let me. But yeah, I was very – just as just – All day long. I think yeah, that's just as well. I, yeah, and I absolutely. Got really close. I got close because I got offered a gig with um, um, Cheryl Crow, and I couldn't take it because I was the oh, yeah. I wish I had. And there's a kind of long way round there, Cheryl Crow and and uh, uh, Thingy Cooper, uh, Elton John's percussion player, and then they're all yeah. pal with Bernie Taupin. And they have a band called the Farm mm. Dogs, and they, you know, and I could see myself on that ranch, and I could see myself, you know, getting on with Elton John, you know, he's so funny. So, he yeah. is, yeah. No, that's that's amazing. Um, favorite music documentary or movie that you've seen? Well, it has to be The Last Walls, doesn't it? Really, it has to be uh, the yeah. band, Great uh, pick. The Last Walls. Although I did watch a um, yeah. documentary on Netflix, I think it's about uh, Linda Ronstadt, who I love all that. Oh, yeah. Nancy Griffiths, Linda Ronstadt, Americana stuff. It's a fantastic insight into it. But really, Spinal Tap is right up my street. <laughs> Spinal Tap yes, is a movie that's true. so close to the truth at the time, you know, and uh, I've been yeah. to a lot of movies there. And, uh, hilarious but really the last waltz yeah because it has everybody that i love in the one film great pick and um name one thing you'd love to see um invented that would make your life as a keyboard player easier no somebody out there must invent and it's nothing to do with keyboards it's mic stands ever tried carrying mic stands uh-huh. and, and you can only carry like three Good and then point. you get sore bits and you get your fingers stuck in a bit why doesn't someone just make fucking stand with a handle on it? <laughs> and I've That's seen a great them, idea. Yeah, just ones that sink into the stand and pop out when you need to lift two or three of them. You can get three in one and three in the other. Because carting gear in and out of cars is basically the most that we do. We don't sit on tour buses and have roadies all our lives. Somebody um, invent a small Leslie speaker. Well, I've got one, and it's by Leslie, and it's all right. It's okay. Uh, but one that would, you know, a way into a car would do. I need four people to lift the hand yeah. and another three to lift the Leslie. So something like that, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. No, great picks. And um, what keeps you sane outside of music, Jim? So what's your favourite non-musical activity or hobby? You really want to know? Gardening. Yes. Yes. Oh, I nothing find, wrong with that. You're not alone well, either. I find musicians, strangely enough, they love cooking and they love gardening. And I think it's something to do with the fact that they're away all the time. And when they come back, there's a plant there that's there. You know, we've all had broken marriages and kids that are fucked off and bastards, you know, dads fucking, you know, away on tour all the time. But when you've got a plant, my my favourite thing in the world is sitting below me here, which is, is my dog, and I'll be going dog walking yeah. shortly after this. So I love him. Um, I love my fiance. Um, but you know what? Just see getting outside uh, in the garden or in a forest or just nature. I love it. It's as real as it yeah, is. I think, and that's a. 
it is as real as it gets. And look, I, I'd argue it doesn't get much realer than you, Jim. I think the reason you have had so much success and are continuing to have so much success is you are real, you are authentic, and you're a brilliant player to beat, even though you may not think so, but that's all of us have the imposter syndrome. It's been an absolute privilege talking to you. And yeah, here's to many, many more years of um, touring, playing, performing and creating. It's been a real pleasure, David. Uh, I love your saying. Well, there we have it. If you've gotten this far, I hope you had as much fun as I was obviously having uh, during that interview with Jim. I mean, his insights, I would kill to be in a classroom with Jim. I can imagine what he imparts across lessons is just invaluable, let alone his sense of humour and ability as a musician. Um, as I mentioned during the show, if you do hear the Deacon Blue are playing near you, even if you're not fully aware of their back catalogue, it is a joyful experience. The audience react in a huge way to what they do. Um, and please check out some of the video links in the show notes. We'll certainly be linking to a, a number of their live clips. Um, they are just plain amazing. I am biased because they're a fave of mine as a teen and still are now, but definitely check them out. Thank you so much for listening. A big shout out to our gold and silver supporters, Brother Paul Brown from the Water Boys. Brother Paul, thank you. And um, Brother Paul, has just released an album, um, The Brothers Brown, The Brown Brothers. I apologise. I should have um, looked that up before I started recording. Do check that out. Wonderful album. I've listened to it a handful of times now. Well and truly some great music. And I believe the Water Boys are hard at it again during 2024. Um, Tammy Catcher from Tammy's Musical Studio. Thank you as always, Tammy, for your ongoing support. We do appreciate it. Um, Radio Grande, a, a YouTube channel for those who like funk reimaginings of some classic songs. Do check out Radio Grande. Mr. Mike at midnightmastering.com. I love this man. I've known him for 30 years. Uh, he does wonderful work with mixing and mastering. Cannot recommend him enough if you're looking to get some loving attention to your own creations. And last but definitely not least, the musicplayer.com forums. Do check them out, the keyboard corner in particular. Um, Dave, Bryce and the team are at NAMM, um, which was is occurring as we record this. Um, and they are bringing back the goodness to that forum and chatting about all the latest and greatest, let alone all the other great conversations that occur there. So, again, thank you for listening. Um, we love hearing from you. You can check out our Instagram at The Keyboard Chronicles. If you search for The Keyboard Chronicles on Facebook, uh, threads, um, we have even on TikTok, LinkedIn, anywhere you search for The Keyboard Chronicles, it's there. And we also love hearing from you via email at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. Once again, thank you for listening, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>